Thank you, Denise. Can you guys hear in the back? Okay. Thank you, Sandile. Thank you, everybody, for being here. A special thanks to the people of the city. They've been really, really wonderful. We've been coming here many times. It's been so friendly. People have been so warm. It's really been a great experience coming to your city so many times in the last five weeks. I want to speak a little bit about our origin, speak about spirituality, speak about my experience in different projects in the country over a period of time, and in that bringing the, the, the concept of hope. For the last few, well, from last year, people have been talking, you know, people have lost hope, people are afraid, people are worried, people are depressed, and all kinds of uh, adjectives explaining that they, 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 want, they want to leave the country, they're not sure if they're safe here, or is there any future in this country? At the outset, let me make it clear, this is the best country in the world. Yeah. Yeah. No matter yes. what the situation is. <laughs> you guys haven't been to war zones. You haven't seen people tear apart each other apart. You haven't seen people being bombed. You haven't seen people have hatred after being neighbors for years. You haven't seen the hardship that's felt by children, women, and all elderly people. I've seen great difficulty. I've been to many countries. I'm doing this for 32 years. And I've led every mission to every disaster myself. So I know the hardship and the difficulty people go through. We know we're nowhere near that. And I'll explain that as we go along, how we can change things and why we are changing things. And in fact, some of the disasters that have come, in actual fact, have been a blessing in disguise because it has helped us change our mindset, change the narrative, and change the way we operate. So let's go. The story starts. Gift of the Givers is not my organization. I didn't get up one morning and say, okay, let's form an organization, get a name, get a founding constitution, write down some principles, get some members, and write down what we're gonna do. No, Gift of the Givers is not my organization. I never thought of forming an organization. It's a very spiritual thing that happened. And that happened from 1985. I was in internship in King Road Hospital in Durban. I wanted to study internal medicine to specialize as a physician. But at that time, there were not much opportunities, so I couldn't get a post to do internal medicine or to, to become a registrar or a medical officer. So I went to Maritzburg because my family was from there, my, my, my wife was from there, my mother had passed on in 1984, and she was in Durban. And my father-in-law said, come to Maritzburg and form a, start, start a practice there. So January 86, I went to Maritzburg. I didn't want to start a practice, but I had no choice. We have lots of difficulties in business. There's lots of things that you don't want to do, but you have to do them. And sometimes, if you look at it spiritually, it works out better in the long run that you did it. So those are the kind of messages you need to understand as I speak, it's subliminal messages. So I get to Marysburg in January 1986, and a week later, my butcher neighbor tells me, I've got a guy here, from, an Afrikaner guy from Pretoria, he came to teach French, Afrikaner guy teaching French, <laughs> at the <laughs> University of Natal. So he said, but he needs a doctor. So he said, my neighbor is a doctor. And I met Miller, and we spoke over a period of time. And one day Miller tells me, you need to go to Turkey. I said, Miller, it's 1986, I haven't seen Cape Town yet. <laughs> <laughs> when am I going to see Turkey? <laughs> he said something very, very profound. He said, what God wills happens. There's a time and a place. The time and a place was five years later. I landed up in Turkey, I'm gonna cut the story short, but I met a spiritual teacher. I saw people of all races, all religions, all colors, all classes, all countries, even people who said they don't believe. Welcome with love in a Muslim Sufi place. It was something new to me. We come from an apartheid past, we have prejudice. The Gulf War didn't help. It polarized nations and civilizations and cultures and religions. And you're going with a stereotype mindset to this place and you suddenly see, no, no friction, no discord, no fighting. And you think, is this really possible in the real world? Can it really happen? And kept an open mind, and that day, stereotypes left me. And my first lesson, even before Gift of the Givers was, you don't be, put people in boxes. White, black, colored, Christian, Jew, atheist. No, you don't do that. You treat people on their merits as a human being. You don't run people down for one or two faults. You look at the fault, not the person, and don't run the person down. And they, a person may have one or two bad qualities, does not necessarily make the person bad. Intrinsically, we have some people who are really bad, 
you know. But overall, we have other people who are not like that. So we can't write a person off because of one or two, because we all got bad faults. Let's be honest, there's no saints here. So I go for pilgrimage the following year, and I say, I want to go back to this place, it's right. Because even in Islam, we have a lot of different uh, paths, different paths that lead to God. And I wasn't sure if this was the right path, because I, I was never taught that. And you know, teaching is different, processes are different. And I said, if this is the right path, I want to go back there. Thursday, 6th August, 1992, 30 years ago, in 18 days time, I landed up there at 10 p.m. after a spiritual session called a zikr. A zikr in Sufi tradition is the recitation of God's names in Arabic. So we'll say the one and only, kind, compassionate, merciful, cherisher, nourisher, sustainer, loving, eternal, in Arabic. And when that finished, the spiritual teacher made eye contact with me and he looked heavenwards at the same time. And he spoke in fluent Turkish. And I don't understand a word of Turkish. But I understood every single word that he said in Turkish on that night. He said, my son, I'm not asking you, I'm instructing you to form an organization. The name in Arabic will be Wakful Wakifin. Translated, it means gift of the givers. You will serve all people of all races, all religions, all colors, all classes, all cultures, of any geographical location and of any political affiliation. But you will serve them unconditionally. You will expect nothing in return, not even a thank you. In fact, in what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life, Expect to get a kick up your back. If you don't get a kick up your back, regard it as a bonus. Serve people with love, kindness, compassion, and mercy. And remember, the dignity of man is foremost. That's the operative word to save this country. The dignity of man is foremost. And I'll come back to that. So if someone is down in the ground, don't push them down further. Hold them, elevate them. Wipe the tear of a grieving child. Caress the head of an orphan. Say words of good counsel to a widow. These things are free. They don't cost anything. Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and provide water to the thirsty. And in everything that you do, be the best at what you do. Not because of ego, but because you're dealing with human life, human emotion, human dignity, and human suffering. He goes on to say, this is an instruction for you for the rest of your life. And remember, my son, the most important in what I've told you is, remember this, that whatever you do is done through you and not by you. I'm a living witness to that for 30 years. That the kind of things that you guys think that I do is not humanly possible. I know exactly what to do, and it's just shown to me. And that takes me to the next point. I told you I, didn't, I don't speak Turkish. At some point, not that same night, at some point I asked him, I said, how is it that when you speak Turkish, I understand? And somebody else here speaks Turkish, I don't understand. <laughs> he said, my son, when the hearts connect and the souls connect, the words become understandable. I asked him, you told me all these things. What am I supposed to do? What do you exactly want me to do? I'm a doctor in private practice in a place called Peter Marisburg, and I have three surgeries. So is this after hours? <laughs> weekends, long weekends, public holidays, school holidays, when and what? He told me one line, you will know. For 30 years I do know. What to do, how to do, what not to do, what to touch, what not to touch. Every single aspect, I do know, I don't know how I know it, but I do know it. And the moment I walked out of that place, the inspiration came, respond to the civil war in Bosnia. And the same month, I took in 32 containers of aid into Bosnia, into a war zone. In November, another eight containers of winter stuff. And in February 93, we started designing the world's first containerized mobile hospital. A product of South African technology. We don't believe in ourselves. Africa doesn't believe in ourselves. ourselves. This was not built in Europe and northern countries. It was built in Africa. A world first made in our country and taken to Europe. We took it to Bosnia. And when the CNN commentator watched the hospital, 
on February 1st, 1994, the CNN commentator said, the South African containerized mobile hospital is equal to any of the best hospitals in Europe. And that was in 1994. But what did these three missions tell me? They told me in essence, that gift of the givers was going to be a disaster response agency. And that whatever we do will be built around it. We have 21 categories of projects today. Not 21 projects, 21 categories of projects, and each one has subcategories. And we run them all consecutively or simultaneously. So we needed to evolve as an organization. I'll come to the other parts just now. It was up to 2004. Usual story, tents, blankets, medicines, food, bottled water. That's all that we did. And over the years, of course, we added on bursary services, primary healthcare clinics, counseling services, support groups, uh, food parcels, feeding schemes, and a whole range of things, 21 different projects over a period of time. But 2004, 26 December, I was on my way to Cape Town, <laughs> and the tsunami struck. And at that time, we said we're going to respond. And how we all respond is, the president or the head of state was making an announcement, I need help. And the president of, uh, of Sri Lanka, Chandrika Kumara Tunga at that time, stood up and said, we don't know what to do. So I said my teams, that's where we're going to. We didn't have medical teams then, at that day, but we were the first people in the world that responded to the crisis in tsunami, uh, in, uh, in Sri Lanka. Within 24, 48 hours, we were the first team that met the president but in five days, we partnered corporate companies, and I'll come to the roles you have to play. We delivered seven million rand and of aid in five days. I flew in planes from India, from Dubai, and from Colombo across the bro broken bridges to deliver medicines and supplies inside Sri Lanka, and I did it from here. <coughs> and everything was sent across. But we had another country to respond to. In Somalia, Northeast is a place called Hafun. And that place is in Africa. They were also affected by the effect of the tsunami. If Africa doesn't de help Africa, nobody else is going to help Africa. Mm -hmm. Another message. This is our continent, and we need to fix it ourselves. Right. So we landed there, and for the first time, I took a primary health care team, a medical team. Eight months later, a famine in Niger, and we take a, a medical team, but not primary health care only. Primary health care, trauma, post-op rehab, general surgeons, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, anesthetists, theater assessors, nurses, ICU nurses, and we take a team. When we get there, the Pakistani general comes to us and says, do you mind not going to the earthquake? So I said, which hospital are you going to give me? So he says, you understand? I said, yes, I understand. He said, I'll give you the cantonment hospital of Rawalpindi. So my teams asked me, uh, why did we come? If you can't go to the earthquake? I said that you don't understand what the guy is saying. Everything is destroyed on the top. The hospitals, the buildings, the people, there's just too much of death there. You can't do anything there. You have to, people have to come down, and that's why I asked for a hospital. So, but I asked, have you got helicopters to go and stabilize those that are alive, and we can bring them down? So he said, my friend, all the helicopters are gone on emergency missions. This is a huge earthquake. It hit us from Rawalpindi right to the Kashmir border, an entire region. We don't have those helicopters. Now in my business, that's why I don't want to be president. We don't follow rules. <laughs> So I looked around and I see the American Air Force. Now pre-Gulf War, I would have never gone to them. Post-Gulf War, it's a different thing. After I went to Turkey. In disasters, you work with everybody to get the job done. So I see the American Air Force there. I go to them, I said, I told my, the first M secretary was from South African Embassy was with me. I said, who you stay out of this? You guys just complicate everything. <laughs> Let me go there. I see a big black guy. I said, my brother, where are you from? He says, I'm from America. I said, you're black, you're not from America. <laughs> I said, you're from Africa. He said, yes, I'm from Africa, but I live in America now. I knew what I was saying. <laughs> he said, you, I said, I'm from South Africa too, from Africa. What can I do for you? I said, brother, I need your help. I need a helicopter. You need a helicopter, my brother? Take three. <laughs> <laughs> two Black Hawks and another help in two minutes. Sure. Now imagine if the two governments spoke to each other, I'd still be waiting for the <laughs> Anyways, the helicopters go to the mountain. We're walking to the Cantonment Hospital of Rawalpindi. We get the smell of gangrene, the stench of death, not enough medical personnel, no disinfectant, no nursing teams, no IV lines, no food, children lying on the stretcher, need amputation, nobody there for them. We call a general. We said, what is this? 
Is this an organized killing field? What's happening here? I said, you put, will you put your mother in here? He looks at me shocked. The CEO comes and said, don't you know we're decommissioning the hospital, General? So I said, you guys are mad. There's nothing wrong with the hospital. So what can we do? Whilst we're speaking to them, northern country organizations come across. A little confused when they see us. White guy with English accent, white guy with African accent, <laughs> Hindu guy, guy with Hashim Amnaz beard, and all, all mixed guys sitting there. Where are you guys from? We said, Afri from Africa. Africa? All like this, mixed up like this? They look stunned. Oh, what did you come for? You guys are always looking for free things. You guys always come with a begging bowl. What did you come for? I said, my friend, you will eat your words. Yes. So I gave the Pakistani general the list. In 24 hours, the cantonment hospital of Rawal Pindi that was shutting down, we converted it into a 400-bed emergency hospital. 75 operations a day, and we saved many lives. And those same northern teams, we allowed them to work with us in the hospital. For that, the Pakistan President Parvaz Musharraf gave us the presidential award in 2006 for saving the people of Pakistan in the disaster. <laughs> we had everything. When I'm talking to you about the development of our organization, I need you to understand how business should develop also. How you should apply your mind laterally. We were doing everything and we had, we had trauma counselors after that. There was one aspect that was missing. You, you will analyze your business all the time, what's wrong? I mean, how would a company of 40 years fall apart in three weeks when the COVID hit? There's something wrong with the way you guys are budgeting. There's something wrong with the way you spend. There's something wrong with the way you keep business. How can a company of 40 years fall down in three weeks? It doesn't make any sense to me. Either it's a good way to get rid of everybody, directors take the money, and you put 1,000 families on the road. That's something that's seriously missing, the spirituality in our lives, and I'll talk about that also. So in any case, we look at the stuff, and I said, our weakness as gift of the givers we don't have a search and rescue team. The medical team is second. The search and rescue team is first. So we designed that. And 2010, we had the opportunity to apply it. 12 January 2010, earthquake hits Haiti. Massive earthquake kills 250,000 people in 40 seconds. We put a team together and we fly out via France. But I speak to the French embassy and the French consulate. They give us the visas and then to Air France. We go via Schengen, via Europe. So I tell Air France, will you get my teams into Haiti? They said, yes, we will. I said, you won't? They said, yes, we will. I said, the airport will close. They said, the airport is open. I said, it will close. <laughs> they said, give it to me. In, I said, give it to me in writing. So they give it to me in writing. Which airline gives you in writing? They'll get you to a destination. <laughs> anyway, that was my guarantee. So I parked it off. And I said, oh, these guys made a very big mistake. <laughs> so in any case, I phoned the Catholic Society of South Africa. I mean, Peter Marisburg, I called the guy in Joburg. I said, my friend, I don't know who you are. I need the Pope. So that guy gets stunned. He can't talk for 10 seconds. <laughs> Why does the Muslim guy want the Pope? <laughs> so I said to her, Why do you want the Pope? I said, Are you Christian? The guy is not connected. You know, we Muslims, we connected all over the world. <laughs> but that's a little bit embarrassing for the guy. So he says, we, we can make arrangements. So he said, Why? I said, I want a Catholic team to meet my teams in the Dominican Republic to take them across into Haiti because they're never going to land in Haiti. Six o'clock in the morning, the guys land. We've got a problem. I said, I know. There's no flight, is it? The airport is closed. He said, yes. I said, don't worry. You want a two hour, in two hours, you're on another flight, the Dominican Republic. Here's a number, meet you on the other side. Catholic Relief Services, CRS, and Caritas were the Catholic agencies that received my team in Dominican Republic. South African team, welcome. Accommodation, water, transport, visa, everything you require, and we take you across into the other side, and you will stay in our compound inside Haiti. They go across day eight on 12, 20th January 2010. We make world history. My teams call and say we can hear sounds in the rubble in the collapsed Catholic Church. And they go in three hours later and they pull out alive 64 year old and Azizi. Fractured hip, no oxygen, no water, no food, no support, completely covered by rubble and they pull her out alive eight days later. Jeez. And she says, I love God. We instill hope in somebody several thousand kilometers away. And then she tells my team, I love you. But never before in the history of the world has any team from Africa taken anybody out of the rubble alive in an earthquake outside the African continent. 
we were the first to do that. Hayat, is there hope for us? As a continent, as a people, we have the skill, we have the experience, and we can do things. That was not over. The medical team came from the back. And the northern countries, uh, teams instead of saying we want to work, said we can't do this. It's too complicated. There's no CT machines. Theaters are broken. How are we going to do this? And the South African team stepped forward. Because when they traveled with me, the first teaching I give them is, I say, take your medical council book and throw it out of the window <laughs> before you travel with me, because those things don't work. Listen to your gut feel. If you do nothing, the patient is certainly going to die. If you do something, maybe 10% you'll save somebody. So I apply the 10% rule, throw the book out of the window. And they do that. So they go forward and the guy, orthopedic surgeon, Johnny the Beer, asks for a drill and they give him a black and decker. <laughs> and he says the bone marker plan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we applied and we started working. And the Northern Country organizations to their credit said that if you want healing, you want save of life, then go to the dream team. And the dream team is from South Africa. It tells you about our universities, our professors, our academics, our levels of study. There is a lot of hope in this country. There's nothing wrong with this country. There's just a few things that we've got to fix and we can fix it. And I'll come to that. Fast forward, 2016 November, I decide to kill all international marketing. Not the projects, but I tell people like you, like sensational stuff. All the journalists and all the media guys, you guys want all sensational stuff. So I kill all the sensational stuff. The projects don't die, they multiply five times. But the media, client, uh, uh, the media part I kill altogether. But for that to happen, to focus on something local, something local has to happen. And June 2017, the fire came in nice now. <coughs> and for the first time, corporate South Africa, which never supported us before, sorry, I'm a very blunt guy, never supported us before, suddenly saw the skill of what we had. We sent in two lady managers that controlled the output for 20,000 families. Food parcels, blankets, sanitary pads, hygiene packs, whatever else is required, diapers and, and the works. To the credit of all those people living in Nizla, they came forward and said, check us shop that came first and said, yes, our car park, take it. as a warehouse. I said, what about your customers? They said they can park on the road. <laughs> take the building, it's an emergency now. Now that's what I like. You think fast in an emergency. <laughs> Government doesn't understand three words. Urgency, emergency, and disaster is not in their vocabulary. When they declare a national disaster, they take them nine months to decide what to do. <laughs> so why even declare a national disaster? That's a serious problem. And that's a major problem in this country. Politicians don't understand disasters. So they go across, and all the people came across with four by fours and buckets and said, your truck can't go in the car park. I said, we know that. Don't worry, yes, the bucket. Offload the truck in the bucket up, make the food parcels down and deliver. And everybody in Naizda came forward. There was no issue about race, no issue about color, no issue, I'm the CEO of some top company, or you're the guy down in the ground in the informal settlement. We are all citizens of Naizna, and we're going to do this together. It was a huge experience in Ubuntu, in humanity, in nation building. It's a, it, it develops over a period of time, and they did that. So whilst we were delivering the food parcels, people came and said, I like the humanity of South Africans. The cat and dog hasn't eaten yet. What do we do about that? So I said, what do I do about that? <laughs> they said, we need cat food and dog food. So we sent cat food and dog food. People sponsor all container load of it and they give the cats and the dogs. Then somebody comes and says, you know why the fire was so big? Because Niza was in a drought before the fire came. So everything burnt. So the sheep, the pigs, the cattle, the cows, the horses, everybody's hungry. So I must do something about this too. <laughs> I'm deciding I'm a specialist in human being, people dying and getting injured. This is all a new field to me. So I said, make the arrangements, I'll pay for it. So we bring all the stuff in. Then somebody comes and says, what about the wild animals in the, in the outside in, in the wild park? And the elephants in the elephant park. So we do all that and we give them stuff too. I said, anything else? <laughs> <laughs> and then we sent in, we would have the firefighters. We brought in advanced life support paramedics, advanced life support ambulance services. We brought in specialist medical teams, moved the patients from Nizana to Georgia and all over, even delivered babies and fed the fire, uh, fighters, 1,200 of them, twice a day. But and, and nutrition, just, they eat just energy biscuits and water and liquids and drink and energy and all that kind of stuff. And some days we even provided meals for them. Then while doing all that, on the Thursday evening, a guy walks into the checker's place and he says, I didn't get sugar. 
So I said, Emily, you didn't get sugar. He said, he's right. We ran out of sugar, it's coming just now. So I said, Grant, you'll get your sugar just now. So he says, it's not for me. So I said, for, for your neighbor? No, it's not for him either. Then who is the sugar for? He says, it's for the bees. I'm thinking this guy has a good top seven. <laughs> Which bees eat sugar? I don't know about that one. Uh, the first time this guy tried to catch me. So I said, you know, just give this guy sugar. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and that evening, I said, no, the story doesn't sound finished. I got to speak to this guy again. So I said, you better come back tomorrow. I need to know about the story and the sugar and the bees. Mm -hmm. He comes back to me and he tells me an amazing story. He says, you know, the fire was there because of the drought. And all the faint boss and everything washed away. And bees could not eat the faint boss, it was gone. And we had 300 beehives there. And each beehive holds 75,000 to 80,000 bees. We lost 22 million bees. And he said, the Cape honeybee is the most versatile bee in the world. It can take, we, we need to learn from that. You know? It can survive any type of difficulty. It's very resistant. And when the queen bee dies, the other bees, worker bees, are haploid and diploid. They can make a new queen bee. That's the, 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 the type of bee that we have here. So I said, okay, I understand that part. How does the sugar fit in all this? <laughs> so he said, when they got no fame boss or other things to eat, we give them a nectar pollen substitute, but that thing is too expensive. And the last solution, generic medicine, we put some sugar in the water and we give them that. <laughs> so I said, okay, I will give you money to regrow the plants, but obviously that's not gonna happen today. You're gonna give you nectar pollen substitute, I'll give you 300 beehives, and I'll give you sugar right now. That place has become a research center up till today. They're grooming young people, teaching them about bees. It's becoming a research center and it's still running in Niza and it's expanding. And then whilst working there, somebody calls me and says, do you know Sutherland is collapsing? The farmers in Sutherland are collapsing, the most important merino sheep in the world. The sheep count was 440,000, it was dropping 400,000, 350,000, 300,000. The animals were dying, the economy was dying. And they said, can we get involved? And I said, what do you guys want? Fodder. So we started supplying fodder to the sheep to try to save them. Now this is another problem I have. When we said to corporate companies, let's get involved in supporting the farmers with fodder, they told me it's not politically correct. That has to stop. It's not politically correct, so what? Who are the white farmers employing? White people or black people? We need to change the thinking in this country. Everybody is a human being in this country and we all need to work together. We don't have to have this false, this barriers between us. It's killing the country. We need to work together and break that. So we supported it. And in June 2018, not only with the father gone, all the balls dried out. I sent in my teams led by Martin Landman. And we drilled 238 bowls to save those farms in Sutherland. Because that economy contributes 18.2% as part of all agriculture to the GDP of our country. It creates jobs, it brings in foreign currency, it brings in exchange. What happens? You saw what happened in Ukraine. You can't export stuff there anymore now because of the war. What happens? Everything collapses. The pears, the plums, everything can't go. Similar effect, yeah, we could produce, but we just didn't give it the support because of our issues. We need to change that. The mindset has to change. And we drilled the 238 bowls. And in January this year, for the first time, the sheep count from 31,000 is starting to go upwards again. We put in 45 pellets, to nutrition food, made with lucerne, molasses, maize, and other items, so the sheep can eat undercover, so the animals can go and scavenge on them, so they can survive. Three days ago, the farm couple that's doing this, Sybil and Jan, called me and they were crying. They said the fuel price, the cost of maize, and everything has gone up. The farmers can't support themselves. We can't put it up one more cent on that bag. They won't survive. 65% of farmers, black and white, are going to collapse because they can't afford the bag. I put in another 300,000 rand. I said, this is my side. Give it to the people. If you need more, call me again. I'll give you another 300,000 rand. We have to save the farmer. We have to save the sheep. We have to save agriculture because that contributes to all of us together to benefit in this country. And so we went on with that project. And day, 2018, we have day zero in Cape Town, brought in containers. And all these things I'm telling you, it shows the generosity of our society, the goodness of our people to work together. Which by ship, containers came from Durban, and by road transport, we brought 300 containers of water to Cape Town. We drilled boreholes inside and outside Cape Town. The people in Cape Town think Western Cape is Cape Town. 
Western Cape is not Cape Town. There's areas outside Cape where there's a lot of people in the rural areas that must not be forgotten, you know, and that's what happened. So we supported that. 2019 came the call from Makanda. There's no water. And we got involved in Makanda. And they said, municipality told us we'll be there for four days. We're there for three years already. <laughs> but we, we knew we were going to have that problem. We drilled 15 boreholes. We went to the craft net. I'm, I'm fast forwarding it. 2020 and 2019, and this is where we're coming up to the important things now. 2019 and 2018, I'm telling my medical teams, we world class when we go all over the world. People can't understand our skill at which we operate and how we work. We need to get involved in the hospitals locally. They said, ooh, <laughs> never gonna happen. If the bureaucracy and the red tape will kill us, it's a crime to come to help in government public hospitals. You can't even give anything for free because people can't make a backhand. You can't do things like that, it's not gonna work. So I said, we gotta find a way. I told you I specialize in breaking rules. So 2020, the COVID came. Right? Yes, it came with this crisis, but I saw the opportunity. <laughs> All the hospitals started calling Baraguana, Charlotte Makeke, Helen Joseph, Rahima Musa, George Mukari, Shana General, and all over the country. 210 hospitals were in trouble because somebody was having fun with our PPE money, 14.7 billion rand. So we said, we're gonna get involved and we started delivering. After two weeks, I get a call from somebody in Gauteng Health. Some guy got too clever. And he said, you know, you need an MOU, and you're gonna give a letter, and you're gonna do this to my friend. I said, my friend, I don't know such thing. <laughs> this is a disaster, you want it, yes or no? You got 10 seconds. <laughs> he said, my friend, just do what you have to do. <laughs> 210 hospitals we've delivered up till today. No letter, no request, nothing writing, no MOU. It's about saving South African lives. Yes. And this brings to the point. Everybody was scared, and I'm quite blunt about it. The government needs to understand this country does not belong to them. This country belongs to me and to 65 million individuals. Yes. And when we take ownership of the country, then we need to fix it ourselves. We can't sit back and say, oh, we pay rates and we pay this and that. Because to be fair to government, seven million people's taxes can't look after 65 million people. It's impossible. If you put the German government here, or the American government here, or the Australian or the Canadians, they have the same problem. You can't change the fact that 7 million people's taxes can't look after 65 million people. Yes, they must take responsibility for state capture, for wasting money, for PPA money disappearing, for having a friend, giving the cat the contract, giving the dog the contract, giving the grandfather the contract. They must take responsibility for that. And giving contracts to people who don't know what the hell they're doing. Yeah. That can't happen. They take responsibility for that. But while saying that, Everybody in government is not bad. There's a lot of good people in government. Like there's a lot of good of people in SAPs. There's bad people in the corporates too. There's got bad people in the religious services too. There's bad people in the law system. There's bad people in the medical system. There's bad people in NGOs. We have bad people everywhere. But we have people, well, intrinsically very bad, or we have people with bad habits, as I explained to you before. So we need to hold the hands of the good people in government and take them forward because a lot of them do want the help. And they tell you quietly, I don't know what to do. <coughs> they tell you on the side, please can you help. They have the heart of the country, in the, you know, they, they care for the country. And that's why it gives me so much of hope. Today at the ball, Elizabeth Duncan, it wasn't an official Mandela Day board, but we already opened it a few weeks ago. But to the credit of the Minister of Water and Sanitation, Senator Mchunu, Oscar Mabuyana, the Premier, the MEC of Finance came, and the DG of Water and Sanitation, the Mayor of the city, the Deputy Mayor, and other people came, to acknowledge and to thank for putting the borehole, not only Elizabeth Duncan, but everything that we've done for the city. Now that takes some kind of humility. And the fact that they can do that, and look, I'm very hard with government. They said, tell me I'm brutal with them. That's the reality. But in the day we fight and in the night we friends. Because there's a lot of good people that can do a lot of good things. And we need to understand that. But they need to understand also that they can't do it alone. This hard-handed you, I'm here and you're there. It's changing. A lot of that is changing where the president and ministers are saying, we need the help of private society. We need the help of private sector, but they need to open those channels. It's opening slowly, but it will happen. We have no choice. We have to make it work. And that's why it gives me so much of hope. So we delivered uh, CPR machines, and this was the government thing. And then I'll go to the last part. In November of 2020, I get a message from Professor Justin Jonas from Rhodes University. He says, Dr. Suleiman, we need your help. So I said, Professor, what's the problem? He said, Ibrahim Patel, Minister of Trade and Industry, asked civil society and the engineers from the SKA Telescope and other engineers 
to design the machine for oxygen delivery. Because all the machines from ventilators from China were taken up by China or Europe or America, and we couldn't compete with our, our rents. The dollars and euros, euros were too strong. So we couldn't get the ventilators. I wasn't interested in ventilators because I know they don't save lives. You know, very few ventilators actually work to save lives. When you're on the ventilator stage, you're out. 5% or 6%, most cases 0%. That is, it didn't work. So I said, Professor, I'm not really interested. And then I get to Tiger Book Hospital in the first week of December, and the doctors are telling me, we've got a shortage of oxygen delivery devices. People are dropping dead in the car park. They're dropping dead in the cars. They're dropping dead in the casualties. They're dropping dead at home. Eastern Cape, the call started coming from all hospitals. Same message. They're dropping dead. We need oxygen delivery devices. So I go back to email. Oops, not ventilator, CPAP machine, something different. <laughs> so I called Professor Jonas. I said, where's the machine? He said, it's here. So I said, what's the problem? He said, Ibrahim Patel asked us to do it. We formed the National Ventilator Group. We've designed the model. That's government agency. CSIR, a government agency, manufactured it. SAPRA, a government agency, authorized it for use for COVID in South Africa. Solidarity Fund, part of government, paid 250 million rand for it, for 20,000 machines, good price. So I said, where's the problem? The problem is that you can't deliver it to the government hospitals. I said, something the government made can't get it to a government hospital. It does not make any sense to me. They said, we're being blocked. I said, where's the machines? They said, they're in Cape Town, Acacia Medical. I said, send them. I first gave the first lot to Tiger Book Hospital. What in one hour? They said, saving lives. Gave it to Kylie Chai. I said, let me get another perspective. Kylie Chai said, we just save four patients now, lives now. On the list, CEOs of Eastern Cape Hospitals. Do you want it? Please bring it. My teams, Corinne, uh, Ali, and the teams in Eastern Cape. We delivered all the trucks to Eastern Cape. In 48 hours, we delivered 900 machines to 40 hospitals. Again, why I got hope. Not the nurse or the junior staff. The CEO of the hospital was waiting 11 o'clock at night to receive the machine, to put it on the patient to save lives. That Monday, the first CEO who called us was from Kala Hospital. He said, my friend, every weekend, we get together on a Monday and we sob and we cry because we, 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 it's morbid for us. We count all the number of people that died. For the first time in COVID, nobody died this weekend. That machine saved everybody's life. It shows government cannot be allowed to do what is not correct. So we put that in and we fought it. And the, let me get to the unrest. And when the unrest came, we were leaderless. Nobody stood up. Nobody said anything. The police service was ineffective. The state security was ineffective. And people were scared. But it was not an insurrection. This was not an insurrection. Get it right. In fact, if anything gave me hope, was that event. It showed that South Africa will not allow this thing to happen in our country. Eight provinces said, we're not going to allow this to happen. The taxi drivers got up and said, we're not going to allow this to happen. And civil society got up and said, we will defend our country. All races stood together. But look at the people who went took to the malls. The real people who did this are the traitors, the, the anti-patriots, who, who mobilized people to go and do things which people were not keen to do. Told them, go to a mall. A two-year-old child, what threat is he to the country? Takes a pair of shoes, an old lady on a walking stick. Nobody had stones, nobody had guns, nobody had knives. They were just taken to the malls and instigated to go and take the malls. Students were organized in Buria, or buses came and go to West Street and take the expensive stuff from the shops. What kind of morality are we teaching them? What kind of ethics are we giving the nation? Is it okay to do the wrong thing? And there was remorse, yes, afterwards. And nobody was a threat. The voicemail messages, the social media posts were making people scared. There was no substance in that. Because in an insurrection, you attack the army, the military, the parliament, and the, uh, the union buildings. Not a shopping mall. Yeah. Makes no sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it was all misunderstood. Three days later, all the people who were, who were tensed were standing in the line together in KZN. And you'd swear that nothing happened. Everybody was giving each other bread and water and goods and standing together as one nation. When I saw that, I saw great hope for this country. And the floods, the last point, when the floods came, on 11th April, the first guys who called us were not people that we are sinking and we're drowning and we need help. The first guys that called right up to midnight was corporate South Africa. What can we do? How can we help? What do you need? And that change has come from the time of the COVID. South African corporates are becoming more human oriented. They're getting more interested in the lives of the people. Because before you guys had the CSI division, they don't know what the hell was going on. Okay, you would just say 90% be black, 
see PDF of black uh, text certificate, get an article in, in the SLS paper, get something original Radio Algoa, you know, uh, VW and FNB and uh, all other companies are very good people, and it is some good thing for our country, if we get some good points there, you've got to stop. You have to know what they are you doing. And when the CEOs got involved, they started changing things around. What do you need? This country needs infrastructure, needs humanity, and needs its dignity. People are not standing up because they're hungry. Because if that's the case, those problems would have burned long time ago. Eastern Cape, the children are dying of malnutrition every single day in this province. In 2003, 2002, when we had the World Summit on Sustainable Development in South Africa in Nazareth, 163 kids died in Eastern Cape during that summit. So that hunger is here for a long time. Our, as a nation, we need to invest in the lives of our people. And once we do that, everything will grow together. We have to hold the hand of government, but we have to become human in our approach. Fix, why was a child die falling down a put toilet? They have no proper classrooms. In, uh, to, tomorrow we're starting in Peter Marysburg in a school called TPA. 173 kids got learning disorders. How can a teacher in a class with 40 kids have those for hundreds? Where's the opportunity? Where's the chance for them to do something? We're investing, we're taking over the whole center. We're putting in teachers at our cost, learning center. And this is what we need from corporate South Africa. Fix the hospitals, fix the schools, fix the toilets, and let's take people who have got skills, put in more OTs in hospitals, and tell government you've got three years. Get your taxes right, get your finances right. We're going to run the system for three years. After three years, you take over. We'll put the teachers, we'll put the doctors, we'll put the nurses, we'll put the OT, we'll put the dietitians, we'll put the skilled people, and let's put people in hospital in the way they require. This country needs skills and it needs experience, and a lot of that is gone. People don't know what to do. 267 municipalities, we need 10 good people. An auditor, an engineer, a technical guy, a PR person, and people who can do the job. We do that, we'll fix the service delivery. We'll fix the country, we'll fix everything else. We got the skills. We can go into war zone, we can go into disasters, we can fix it, we got the people. Doctors are retired, we're asking you to come back and have the hospitals. Teachers are retired, can help kids, give them an opportunity. Engineers, we want you back. Water guys, we want you back. Business guys, we want you back. The country does not belong to the government. It belongs to you and me. And it belongs to you and me, we take responsibility of saving our country ourselves. I've seen war zones, I've seen the people who drove the recovery in war zones were business people. Business carried on when the war was taking place and people were dying. The guys that saved the country were business people. Thank you very much for all the support you guys have given, for changing your mindset. We need to build this country, black, white, Indian and colored together, everybody in a human, compassionate way, and we can do it. It's not impossible. We can save the country, the simplex type. Yes, load sharing happens, but it hasn't collapsed. There are countries far worse than us where they have only 7% electricity. You don't want to see these problems now with the war in Ukraine. Their, their health systems are collapsing. Their water systems are collapsing. Their energy systems are collapsing. Everybody, come back to South Africa. This is a great country. Thank you very much. <laughs>